Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 612, as I check my notes. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. Today is July 21st, 2020. All right, welcome to another show. Yes, I'm still traveling in the RV. We're at Zion National Park out here in Utah, and I've been posting some pictures on Facebook if you want to follow along. Actually, for those of you who are new to the program, if you want to be Facebook friends with George and I, I always put the link in the show notes on our YouTube channel. You just uh, go to the YouTube, click on any video you want, and you go down there and you're going to see the hyperlink for my uh, Facebook and George's you click on that and you do a friend request and if you don't have a strange looking person uh, picture on your profile will probably will accept the friend, friend request we're not too picky I'm not picky at all so that's what I've been doing George how is hot hazy humid Florida doing oh wonderful uh, we've just completed our parish reopening survey mm -hmm. three quarters uh, almost 80 percent of the people are too frightened to come back. Sure. 20% 20, 20 do want to come back. And so we have a vestry meeting tomorrow to decide how we go forward with that information. We also found that uh, three quarters of the people watch on TV or on video our show, our, our shows, our <laughs> Sunday services, which means a quarter of the people haven't been to church in three, going on three months now. Yes. So a lot of so the, the question is, when do we reopen? I'm pushing for Labor Day weekend. Uh, but if, as we were talking before the show, there is a spike in the villages, which is about 40 minute, 45 minute drive, about 30 miles. Mm -hmm. uh, hasn't hit here in Hooterville yet, but the, uh, the, the, but no one is dying, but people are getting sick. So there's a lot of fear, but no hard facts from which to base uh, rational decisions. Uh, my church back home has been open, I think this is the sixth week, fifth or sixth week. Uh, they have two services, one at uh, uh, 8 and one at 10. And, uh, you know, they tried to do as operational as possible. Some people have been violating the mask policy and are getting talked to by the, the rector. But uh, it's it's a new, new way to worship. It's a new normal uh, singing with your mask on. And... Uh, I'm out here in Mount Zion. The campground is completely full. You know, everybody's here. Nobody gave up their reservations. Uh, people who are concerned are walking around in mask. All the staff have mask. Uh, if you go to any shop or store, the employees have mask. And in generally, about 80% of people will wear a mask in a store. Um, Don't you need that for all the dust in the air? And a everything? lot of dust. My bike has a lot of dust on it. So does the RV. Uh, it's a red dust. So um, there's like the, if you watch the national news, Arizona big breakout, Utah breakout, Idaho of all places now has a a breakout of COVID, and I think this is just going to be something in our news cycle in our part of our lives for at least the next couple of years. Uh, nobody knows what to do. There's no vaccine yet, and they're saying that you can become reinfected, and that's the worst type of. Uh, um, uh, virus to have, you know, one we can't get rid of. Let's move on to some news, George, and stop depressing people. Well, here's a depressing story. Well, it's it's an amazing story. Um, I met J.R. Packer probably a dozen times in the last dozen years, uh, and he, here's the setup. I was going to do an interview with Martin Binns uh, in Virginia. And uh, the person I was talking to said, do you want to interview Packer as well? And my brain didn't make the connection. I had not, not met J.R. Packer before this. You're yeah, thinking Vince Lombardi I, or I, who are you? I'm thinking of Packer. Okay. Yeah, it must be a, an assistant at the church or something. Whatever. Yeah, I'll interview Packer as well. So I get down there and, and I, I'm interviewing uh, Martin Min's great interview. And uh, he walks out and in walks J.I. Packer. I blubbered all through this interview. What, he's one of my heroes, you know. <laughs> J.I. were so nice and kind because he knew that yeah, I wasn't all there for that interview. And it was it was a lot of fun. Um, one of the first books uh, I read was Knowing God. And uh, um, certainly 
formational. I'm not a Calvinist like uh, J.I. Packer, but uh, uh, a hero, uh, somebody who's kind of that that direct connection we have to the the time of C.S. Lewis and the time of you know that time period um, and, and John Stott. So great man. He's he he finished well. He worked well, and his his entire life was a, a wonderful ministry. So gonna miss him, you know. He, he was always on the right page at the right time. So, good job, J.I. Uh, George, your former bishop of Central Florida has joined the ACNA. Yes, uh, John Howe and his wife Karen mm -hmm. have uh, given up their orders in the Episcopal Church and have received into the Diocese of the Mid-Atlantic of the Anglican Church in North America started hearing internet rumors in fact kevin you were the one who forwarded me something somebody was asking you a question sure. now i have known john howe for 20 odd years and it's was unknown to me so i contacted our bishop in orlando and he said yes john howe had spoken with the presiding bishop and spoken with him announcing his intentions to leave the episcopal church so far, there's been no official announcement from the Episcopal Church or from the ACNA about uh, Bishop Howe. The only thing that has taken place is that in the Diocese of Central Florida, Clergy News, news the letter, a, a statement was posted that two clergy, Nick Braunschweig, Braunschweiger and Karen Howe, had voluntarily given up their orders. And uh, subsequently, I learned Braunschweiger went to the Church of the Holy Apostles in Northern Virginia, the Diocese of Mid-Atlantic. Mm -hmm. And if you put two and two together, you know, Mrs. Howe is no longer an Episcopalian, so maybe Bishop Howe is no longer. But there's no, uh, nothing public s so far. Uh, and it's been a week now that this has been out there. My biggest question, and I, I'm sure John watches the show. Um, is what's changed. The, the Episcopal Church is just as bad as it's always been. Um, it's nothing has changed since 2008. It's they haven't repented. They were uh, certainly penalized at the last primates gathering. Uh, why now? And you know, I'm glad you're aboard. I'm glad you, you're you're now within the ACNA. But I don't see why now is relevant. That's that's my opinion. I know you have a closer relationship with him, and you probably don't want to say anything. That's fine. That you know, the the show is about respecting those friendships and stuff like that. But that's just that's the first thing that comes to mind. What what's changed now uh, that you know that you would want to join the AC now? Well, I think if we're going to speculate, we'll be getting to the realm of mind reading. Yes, and we don't know. Mm -hmm. And until and unless someone gives their official on the record statement. Uh, that does isn't filtered through uh, something or someone. It's I, I hesitate to uh, speak uh, because I don't know. And you know, Kevin said, "Well, what's the real story?" And I said, "I don't know what the real story is. <laughs> it's got to be a story." Um, well, I mean, is it? Oh, they're being so mean to Bishop Love. They've always been mean to Bishop Love. They were extremely mean to Bishop Lawrence and uh, other bishops before him. <laughs> just like so that's I, I, i'm i'm not asking out of turn i'm asking as a curious journalist uh john if you want to do an interview uh i know you, you sometimes watch the program anglican tv at gmail.com and love to talk to you about it but uh it, it just it it's it's on my brain why why now uh the biggest story of the week is not covid it's not uh the church is reopening. It's not race relations. It's not gender. Indian wars. corruption. It's not Indian corruption, although in India it's the biggest story. It's what's happening in Hong Kong. It's the Anglican Church's uh, Anglican Communion's response to what's happening in Hong Kong. Hong Kong has, in two short years, gone from a thriving democracy to a hyper capitalist communist system that is going to start enslaving political opponents. And it's going to do so under the love and blessing of the Anglican Communion, George. And we're not exaggerating when we say this. The Archbishop of Hong Kong, uh, Po Kong, 
wrote a uh, letter, 900 word letter, to the Church Times in response to their question, what are your thoughts on the new security law in Hong Kong? The new security law was passed unanimously by the Chinese government in Peking, their uh, puppet uh, legislature, without the consultation of the people of Hong Kong. In fact, the people of Hong Kong didn't even see the legislation until after it was enacted. And the legislation is rather dr draconian. It, it, for all intents and purposes, eliminates the special status of Hong Kong, removes it from the common law to the Chinese law system. And particularly, it was designed to stifle civil unrest. So people can be arrested and taken to the mainland and to be tried for treason and sentenced up to life imprisonment for rioting, for uh, subordinate uh, sedition. Um, the political freedoms that the people of Hong Kong once had are now gone. Now, the Archbishop of Hong Kong was asked to comment on this because up and for the past few months, church leaders by and large were opposed. They were opposed to violence in the streets, but they were also opposed to the overthrow of democracy. This past, last week, uh, there was uh, primary uh, elections for the Hong Kong legislature and the pro-democracy activists won hand over fist and the Chinese government just canceled it. No, never mind, we didn't get the result we want. So we're not going to allow these people to take office. What Paul Kwong did was to say that this was a needed, necessary law. It was unfortunate they had to do this, but they needed to restore order. And he then blamed people in Hong Kong for waving American flags. And uh, he says, you know, criticisms of the anti-terror law are anti-Chinese criticisms. Paul Kwong basically saying that nationalism, Chinese government policy, is superior to the rule of law, superior to democratic rights. And he said, I have no worries about the future of the church in Hong Kong. And this has opened him up to some tremendous criticism. I, I'm willing to criticize. I mean, your church is safe because you gave up the gospel and you have nothing to fight for except some buildings and some you know, social events. I'm, I'm very disappointed. I'm, I'm also disappointed in Justin Welby. Justin Welby, this is this is what you're in office for, is to protect uh, people trying to uh, seek liberty. Yeah. Well, Paul Kwong is not just another Chinese bishop. We've had Anglican Chinese bishops in the past, K.H. Ting, for instance, sure. who've gone over to the communists when after the 48 Maoist uh, takeover of China. Kwong is the elected head of the Anglican Consultative Council. In essence, he's the head of one of the instruments of communion. And we have someone who has aligned themselves with the greatest, in terms of quantity, and probably in quality, religious oppressor in the world right now. Um, sure, North Korea is a pretty bad place, but if you're a Uyghur Muslim, it's just as bad as it North is. Korea. I think they have 25,000 Muslims enslaved right now in, in northern China. Oh, million. We're talking millions. I'm sorry. My decimal place is off a little bit. I uh, move a couple of, you know, tw millions of Muslims are currently being enslaved by the Chinese government. And churches are being demolished, destroyed. Mm -hmm. There's, we had a story in Anglican Inc. that in one province, Catholic churches were permitted to reopen only if children were not allowed into the church and not catechized. Um, the Chinese government sees religion as a source of opposition. Now let's just think out loud for a second because we don't know what's in Paul Kwong's mind. We don't know whether the Chinese government has something on him personally. Since 2013, he's been a member of one of the puppet uh, bodies, legislative body, bodies, National People's Council. So we don't know what they have or may not have and human pressure always works. But Kwong is seeing churches on the mainland destroyed. And we know, because this is a published fact in the newspapers, South China Morning Post, the religious leaders of Hong Kong. There are approximately 400,000 Catholics and half a million Protestants in, the, in Hong Kong's special administrative region. 
their leaders were called in to meet with the Hong Kong government. And before that meeting, for instance, the Baptist leader was vociferously pro-democracy and several of the Catholic auxiliary bishops were out in the streets. After that meeting, everybody quieted down. Mm -hmm. um, the only religious leaders who have sort of kept up the crescent, kept up the, the beat are the retired Cardinal Archbishop, uh, oh, his name is yeah, Cardinal yeah. Zen, I think. Yeah. Um, but he's not in office anymore. And I think what was, and I'm speculating, but probably what was said is, look, so long as you will, if, if so long as you are subservient to the party and its interests, we'll leave you alone. If we don't, if you don't, if you are a, a source of opposition like the churches in the mainland, Hong Kong Anglican Diocese has a lot of property. It's has a its people are well placed. Um, they've got a lot to lose if the system turns against them. They're not poor peasants who can just pick up their few implements and move across the border. They're, the Anglican Church is the church of the upper middle classes in Hong Kong with, well, they've got a lot to lose and so they've got to find an accommodation with the devil. Yes. So on one hand, what he's doing is wrong, but you can sort of see what's driving him because John Wayne and the Calvary are not going to appear over the horizon. Uh, the U.S. is not going to go to war over Hong Kong. Britain certainly uh, couldn't go to war over Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. Nobody's there to save them. And short of uh, there being some convenient heart attacks in the Central Committee, they've got to uh, find a way to do a deal with the devil. And that's the sad thing. We've already, you know, in a, a high degree of trade war with China, there's not a whole lot more we can do except, you know, have a complete shutdown of our trade with China uh, to, well, for, to force hands. There's some things we can do. We can expel all these Chinese students sure. who are mostly the children of party leaders. Yeah. I mean, they're, you know, uh, one of the things that's happening in Hong Kong is that we're seeing the, the American Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong has, did a survey and half of the companies, U.S. companies, who have operations in Hong Kong in this last week reported that they're getting ready to move out to either Singapore or Seoul and South Korea or to Japan. Um, Hong Kong as a financial center, as a news center, as a technology center, it's, it's dead. And this is being doubled down by the Secretary of State, uh, Mike Pompeo, saying that we no longer see Hong Kong as an independent region of China, we'll treat them just like we treat China. And what that ha means financially is that this Hong Kong central bank and the Hong Kong dollar, crash. Huh? That's, I'm sorry, that's going to crash. It's mm -hmm. going to be now the Chinese uh, Chinese currency, not the Hong Kong dollar. Yeah, it's going to be, I mean, we are at a place where our hands are tied. We didn't. We allowed China to build an island in the in the South Sea, uh, unopposed. We've you know we've done so much to not offend China over the last seventeen years. We're gonna start paying for it, George. Let's let, let me just yeah, slightly ahead. compare compare the actions sure. of Archbishop Huang to the actions of the Church of the Philippines. While all this is going on, uh, Rodrigo Duterte, the uh, president of the Philippines, has pushed through Congress an anti-terrorism law. And this anti-terrorism law allows the military, not just the police, but the military, to seize you and hold you without judicial warrant for up to 30 days. It allows a government tribunal to designate you a terrorist and define what terrorism is in your case. And if so, then you can be held in preventative detention. Uh, it's a return to the Marcos era of the 70s uh, when there's basically a dictatorship and the Congress and the judiciary were rubber stamps of the presidency. Well, the Catholic Church and the Episcopal Church have been out in the streets. That last sun This past Sunday, the Catholic Church had a pastoral letter read in all churches denouncing this new law. The Episcopal uh, Church of the Philippines uh, has also been very public in denouncing this law. Um, it's an ens it has the same cumulative effects as the Hong Kong law does, but we see the difference now of the Filipino Christian community is standing together. Usually the Episcopalians and the, usually the Protestants, the Catholics don't get on the Philippines because the Protestants are more liberal 
Much on whole sorts of issues, yeah. divorce, this, that, the other birth control. And so on social issues, they're never seeing eye to eye. But here on this issue of uh, civil rights and liberties, the churches are as one against the government. We're, and they're willing to stand to be counted. Where in Hong Kong, they've folded. So let's move on to our next story. And it's something you picked up that I didn't pick up on. Um, as people know, we're having a cancel culture. And that's, you know, we're canceling things we don't like, statues, uh, <laughs> and we deface things we don't like. We, well, we, we managed to ban the Confederate flag. And I am not from the South. My only association as a human being with the Confederate flag is it was part of a show I watched in the 70s called The Dukes of Hazard. It was painted on the top of the, the car called the General Lee. Um, that's my only association with the Confederate flag, so I don't f see it and have pride for it, or it's not part of my, my Southern identity. Um, however, it's banned now from Army bases, but you picked up on the, on the whole story, George. What's that? Well, the network news, some of them, as usual, led with their opinion rather than the facts. Mm -hmm. The Secretary of Defense put out a guidance to military bases saying, uh, you, we are coming down with an authorized list of flags that may de be displayed on military bases. And the reporters read this and they noticed right away that the Confederate battle flag was not on the authorized list of authorized flags. And so the news media, you know, CNN and company had all these uh, sort of heavy breathing stories about Confederate black fags banned at U.S. military bases. Well, one of uh, one of our uh, friends on uh, of this show, uh, Drew Collins, pointed out that in his time in the Army, uh, he was an Army officer. He don't think that he never saw a Confederate flag, maybe as a bumper sticker on somebody's car. But they ju it's just not an issue nobody flies confederate flags anywhere at any time for any reason but if but here's what the networks missed it gave the list of authorized flags and one of the flags not authorized was the gay pride flag the rainbow oh. the rainbow flag oh. now here's the thing i mean that some military commanders in their pursuit of promotion See, in the Army, you'll get ahead not by being a good warfighter, but by being a, a good diversity uh, uh, executive. Have, you know, there have been Army units marching under gay pride flags and parades, and you've had them on gay pride days at bases flown. That flag is now, is now forbidden. So the real story is a flag that had been flown may now not be flown. And to rub it in even harder, uh, some churches, if you go to a Baptist church, you'll see this, what they call a Christian flag. It's a white flag with a blue square with a red cross in it. Some Episcopal churches have them. Uh, I think ours has one somewhere. Yeah, uh, we, in 1990 yeah. we had one, but okay. Okay, it's somewhere. That flag is authorized as a chapel flag. So not only is the gay pride flag not permitted, the Christian flag is permitted. Ah... <sighs> All right, so, George, we have two more stories, but I want to save them for uh, our next show. I want to cover the Meniere and Presbyterian story, but we're running up here in a half an hour, and I wanted to cover that uh, story out of England with the gay rights versus uh, Christian rights. Um, you know, we, we're going to have mercy on our audience. I'm looking here at the time. However, uh, back to J.I., why did you guys just talk for 20 minutes about how great J.I. Packer was? There are so many wonderful articles and uh, biographies about him that I'm going to post here in the links. There's just no way George and I could do it justice in a news-type show uh, uh, talking about uh, great characters like J.I. Packer. This isn't that type of forum, and uh, I hope you forgive us for that. It's also you know? a dangerous topic, I mean, because... Yeah. Many of our viewers are intimately familiar with his work. Yeah. I'm not. I mean, yeah. I have his books, but sure. he was. I'm. I'm on a different team, so to speak. I'm not a Calvinist. <laughs> so my views are of of a admirer, but mm -hmm. not of a devotee, right. if, if that makes any sense. And Same therefore, here. I'd only only anger people who say, "Oh, you got that wrong. You got that wrong." Yeah. I probably do. 
I love JR. I, I'm just not part of the Tulip Society. It, it, it's what you know. It, it's it's that realm. Um, we you know we great man, great life, always on the right page. J.A. Packer. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 612 of Anglican Unscripted.